It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. He's Lars Fredrickson. I'm Dennis Farrell. And Shane Swerve Strickland is joining us in a few minutes. But Lars, we've got a ton of email to get to before he shows up. Should we hit as many as we can before he comes home? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Liam Benjamin says, I listen to a lot of wrestling podcasts, and a lot of them want me to pay one way or another for their content. Thank you guys so much for not putting your show behind a paywall. Please never do. It's a kick in the balls when a rich guy asks you to pay for their content while you're working your ass off listening. You know, that was the one thing we always said we weren't going to do, make people pay to listen to us talk. Yeah, I, I think it's 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 one of those things where, you know, I got I got a cool day job, you know, so night job, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I I I, I kind of feel like this this has always been a fan kind of friendly podcast. We want to talk to other fans. We want to talk to to each other about pro wrestling. I mean, that's the way this whole thing organically happened, especially between me and Dennis. So, you know, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for listening. We're just happy people listen to us. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Liam did say, have a question. When fans work themselves into a frenzy about a return or a surprise, i.e. Sasha Banks with AEW, that never happened. Is it the company's responsibility to debunk it that's that's a good question. Uh, There's a good question. AEW took a lot of heat when Sasha Banks didn't show up, and it wasn't their fault. They never advertised her. Clever wording, maybe, but it's wrestling, and it's their jobs to get you to watch. And what's the worst thing that happens if she doesn't show up? You watched AEW yeah. wrestling? Not horrible night. You know, and here's the thing: it's that that's like some entitlement issues. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you're. Ex- I mean, if you want a wrestling company to apologize to you for something that wasn't even anything that they had promoted or put out there themselves, right? I mean, let's just be honest. That's just the facts, correct? Right. So it was all based in this rumor, and it just goes to show how fucked up American culture is right then and there. Boom. Entitlement issues up the ass. And secondly, rumor has weight weighs, weighs more than fact. It's like the the court of public opinion, you know, is a, it wins again. You know. Let me ask you this: uh, flip side of this coin, mm. AEW, the whole CM Punk thing. You have everybody wearing Cookie Monster shirts, the teasing and whatnot. If he does not show up in Chicago, does a, a, a AEW owe them an apology? Because it's kind of a tease. That was, that, no, that was completely different because that was part of the marketing strategy. I mean, that deal was probably in place a month or two before he actually set foot on their doorstep. So it's like that's, I mean, I, you know, you can't advertise somebody um, or, I mean, that was all strategically done. Let's just be honest. That was. I, I think that that people maybe thought they were dealing with the same thing. That's that's the problem with, I think, the internet in a lot of ways, because it'll ha- have you believing that Saudi Arabia or some Saudi Arabian company is buying the WWE, and now we find out it's just a bunch of bullshit. It was some guy who just put that out there. It wasn't even... But, you know, wrestling journalism, if you even want to call it that, there's got to be some fact-checking. So you can't just live it, listen to David Meltzer and, and think that, you know, you're going to, you know, know everything. It's like you have to, you, you know, what do they say? Believe, believe half of what you see and nothing of what you hear. I mean, that rule still applies, I think, and especially with professional wrestling. Casey John Brick, uh, podcaster, editor, he was uh, he does the prime time with Sean Mooney, Upside 40 with Sean Mooney, Network Classics with Sean Mooney, Wrestling Perspective with Sean Mooney, Sean Mooney, Sean Mooney podcast. We kid, by the way. By the way, we want Sean Mooney. So, uh, Casey, if you're watching, slide in my DMs. We need to talk, baby. Yeah, let's. We need to talk to an old WWF guy for sure. It, I, absolutely. I, I bet you he's got some stories. Uh, what Casey says, wrestling. By the way, it 
flows perfect into this. Wrestling is no fun now with the advert of the internet. Not mm. only can you get spoiled almost instantly, you have to deal with people that are too grounded in reality. There's no suspense or there's no suspense of disbelief anymore. It's kind of sad. He's right. I mean, we talk many times. I don't look at dirt sheets. I don't want to know what's going to happen to be spoiled. I enjoy being surprised when it comes to wrestling, and I don't get that whole I need to know what's going on before everybody else mentality in wrestling. I just don't understand it. I think it's generational. Honestly, I think that the allure, it's like the 7-Eleven generation. You know, you can get anything that you want, anytime you want it, any time of night. So, and there goes back to my entitlement issue kind of shit stuff. So, I mean, I, I, I've always liked the idea to be surprised. I've always liked, you know, that's why I fell in love with professional wrestling in the first place, because there was something exciting and mysterious about it, you know, and it became a form of entertainment. Like, you know, just watching Raw, the 30th, uh, 30th anniversary of Raw, I saw the very first one, you know, but now watching the 30th episode, like I went to my Instagram to check for something and all I could see was the spoilers and it was like, okay, I got to just shut my phone off just because there are a lot of people out there who want to look, look like they know something before you. It's like this competition, even with, you know, in, in any kind of world, really. To, to know something that you don't or to break something that, you know, you haven't seen yet. And it's and so it's a little monotonous, honestly. But I think that if you there are ways to safeguard yourself from that, for sure. BMF, who does our sick logos, by the way, thank you so much. And there's a bunch of other guys who've sent logos and I've not said thank you to them. So this is me saying thank you when I get into the Instagram I'll make sure on the next podcast to pull your names up. I appreciate we appreciate everybody who takes the time to do anything for us. So don't think we don't. But uh, he's got a two parter. We'll at least get to the first one. Maybe the next one next week. The first part is, um, let's see here. Hey guys, what do you think of WWE using announce tables as the brutal landing spots? It seems like it just falls over like building blocks. Then the announcers lose their shit over it. Is it overdone? I don't think so. I still like the announcer spots. I, I get giddy over announcers, chairs, tables. I love all that shit. I think it's it, it, in today's world, it's obviously a lot of things are overdone. Fighting outside of the ring, going through a table at a million miles an hour, and then getting up and running the ropes. I think, honestly, it's the crash course uh, mentality. I mean, I, I think different styles. I, I feel like they're, they're more impactful when they actually mean something and there's a part of, there's a psychology to it um, or a part of the story um, just to do it, just to do it. I mean, sure. There's room for that, you know, on all shows, but I think if you're seeing it every week, it sort of takes the, you know, the gravity of what that is away from it. It's just like anything, but it's like a uh, tattoo on your forehead, you know, I'm, I'm all of a sudden one next week, well, all of a sudden basketball players want to get tattoos on their faces. And so when you, did it because it was punk and it was outlawed. Now you see yuppies with them. You're kind of like, oh, well, <laughs> there goes that. <laughs> uh, Doug Funk Art, D U G. Like that name. D yep, D U G F U N K Art. Question: What finisher should Hulk Hogan have used other than the leg drop, not including the obvious sleeper hold back in the day? Fucking Canadian destroyer. <laughs> I mean, it was the early '90s. Uh, I don't know, a clothesline? I mean, they didn't have clever finishers back then. Well, I feel, but also, you know, he, I think Hulk was a better wrestler than he, he, he just figured out what he could do in that short amount of time and get the job done. So kudos to him in that sense. But, um, you know, I feel like, you know, what he did was perfect. It's like, you know, I mean, The Rock had the elbow. John Cena had the elbow, right? So yeah, he had the, a couple. Yeah, and then I they, mean, I, I wasn't really like a huge John Cena fan. I I would normally tune out when he would wrestle, but that's just me. Unless he was wrestling somebody that I was emotionally invested in. But um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, I think sometimes simpler is better. But you know, you go watch Japanese Hulk Hogan, way yeah. better of a wrestler. I don't. Well, because the demands upon him, I mean, the Japanese companies, I think, are a little bit more meticulous. 
they're a little bit more demanding and I think they're a little bit more um, rigid. There's not a lot of, they, they, they expect something from you. So you're over there because you can deliver that. And it, you don't go back over there unless you deliver that, you know? And I think that's, that's uh, Hulk Hogan just figured out a different way to do it and entertain millions and millions of little Hulkamaniacs all around the world. And, you know, can't fault him for that. Having mm -hmm. another finisher, I don't know. What would you say? I, I mean, I don't, I, but you have to also put back in time what their finishers were clotheslines, yeah. you know, uh, uh, I mean, I think he was yeah. the most innovative move at that time. That's true. Uh, the brain buster, I mean, was, you know, was it was kind of like a DDT. I mean, but. But Hulk was fighting bigger guys than him. So there was no way he was getting, you know, you have to put yeah. it into perspective. He was, he was fighting the evil giant. So what, yeah. what finishers could he have used where he's yeah. not going to have to try to get Andre up like that? He. Yeah. So it's tough. Maybe the leg drop was perfect, you know, and yeah. it wasn't even the leg drop. It was the build up to the leg drop that made it so much special. It was so momentum. Yeah. I mean, it, it was like a momentum finish. Yeah. It's like he hulked up, you know, and then fucking boom, 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 leg drop, boom, one, two, three. Good night. Yeah. So I think it was perfect. It didn't matter what he did. It was the hulking up that made whatever finisher he used special. So sure. let's hit a couple more here before we call this a segment. Uh, Mike Rowe out of New Jersey. If you could make one change to WWE to make some belt special, what would it be? Uh, Mike, uh, for me, I love the Intercontinental Championship. And you can't make the Intercontinental Championship the number one contender belt anymore. But you know, when I read your email and I put it down and I'm going to stall a little bit to give Lars some time to think for me, maybe what if that intercontinental championship belt, if you held on to it at the Royal rumble, it guaranteed you number 30 or something special like that. And then you can have people, you know, throughout the year, trying to get it, trying to hang on to it. And as that Royal rumble comes, you can always build momentum up to who has it, who's going to lose it. So that would bring some prestige to that belt because to me, I was always more invested in the Intercontinental Championship storylines than the WWF storylines. I'm 100%. The belt is right there. The IC belt. Um, I always loved that belt. That was always my favorite belt. Um, I think Gunther is probably the greatest Intercontinental Champion we've seen in a few, in a long time. I, since R William Regal, uh, CM Punk, that feud. Both of them very capable and uh, very talented individuals uh, deserving of that belt. Um, I think it became somewhat of a throwaway after that. I don't think, uh, you know, one belt that I think that the WWE needs, and uh, I might not be the only one, uh, they seem to think that they don't have any success with it. But honestly, let's have a cruiserweight belt. I want a cruiserweight belt. I like to see the high flying guys. I think it breaks up the shows. Um, I think the reason why they probably did out with it because everybody's learning how to wrestle on a trampoline. So it's, it's probably a moot point, but I'd love to see that. Like, I love the cru cruiserweight classic. That was like one of the, my favorite things that the WWE put out NXT, whatever. So, I mean, cruiserweight belt, I mean, I'm a Ray Mysterio guy, you know? So there you have it. All right, well, let's try to get to two more here. Madison says, who is slash was your wrestling crush? Oh, um, it starts and ends with Missy Hyatt for me. Yeah, I, probably Baby Doll. <laughs> you know, probably Baby Doll or uh, Sensational Sherry. You oh, know, like another great one. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, Probably sensational Sherry. That they, they, there was something sexy about both of those women that, you know, my my 16, 15 year old body like went to. But um, you know, I don't think I really had a, a big crush though, you know? Like I, you know, as soon as the swimsuit models and stuff kind of started to come on and it became all, you know, in the whole attitude era, like it it just was so overdone. Like it was it, it would just seem like a bunch of like meatheads that were into that. Now I was, I wanted, you know, to see blood and guts, you know? Uh, 
you know, it was a couple years ago. They were Impact was running a show. I want to say it was in Toronto. I went with PD. Uh, we're backstage, and it was one of the segments where they brought back a bunch of the classics, and Missy Hyatt was there. And say what you will about Missy Hyatt today, I still turned into a blubbering 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old <laughs> boy when she walked by. I'm like, Pete, that's Missy fucking Hyatt. Oh, my God. And he's like, yeah, whatever. Fun yeah. And I'm like, Pete, can you introduce me? He's like, I don't really know her. It'd be weird. I'm like, and I never had the opportunity to talk. She might be a bucketless interview for me, but Missy Hyatt all day long, every day. Uh, I I absolutely love Missy Height and still do. So yeah, I mean that's fair. I read her book. It's you know it's fun. I mean I read it whenever it came out, however many years ago. But uh, yeah, I never I never really was I never was really drawn to wrestling because of that aspect. You know. Uh, I was drawn to wrestling because I wanted blood and guts and violence, you know, and that's I, I don't think I really ever had a wrestling crush. All right. Well, let's get to at least one more from Brandon B. What is your wrestling bucket list? You go first. All right. So I want to sit in the front row hard cam at a wrestling show. Uh, I've been able to sit backstage. I've hung out. I've went to dinner with wrestlers. I have guys who are wrestlers who are my friend. And that is amazing. You know, guys that should not even be talking to me will send me texts like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, what the fuck? But I've never been at like a, a Raw or a SmackDown or even a pay-per-view sitting front row hard cam and not being one of those obnoxious douchebaggy fans that are trying to steal attention i want to be there enjoy the show and just right there somebody comes by either slap my hand or i could pat you on the back or something dumb like that but i want to be there and enjoy the show as just as pure as as that moment is well dennis we're gonna make that happen for you okay really? we're gonna yeah we're gonna make that happen for you uh -huh. so that'll be a, a christmas gift to you uh, later on down the line I'll come to Detroit or whatever it is. When next time that they're there, let me know. Let's let's make this happen. Uh, wrestling bucket list for me. I would love, obviously. I mean, uh, the podcast is is a big thing for me. You know, doing this with you every week. But um, if there's something more than that, I would want to be uh, a writer. Like a, I would like to write theme music for wrestlers for a specific company. So whether it's the WWE or Impact Wrestling or TNA or T TNA, NWA or AEW or uh, MLW, like, guys, I got skills that can pay some bills. But um, I think that would be the funnest thing to do for me as a, <laughs> I mean, I, I, of course, I'm very grateful to be in, you know, the 28 bands I'm in, of course, but to do that. That would be so challenging for me because I feel like it would open up a lot more of my cre creativity. Now, I've listened to a bunch of Swerve Strickland interviews, and in one of them, he mentioned how he kept uh, wrestling and music separate. Have Have you ever written a song about wrestling? Uh, we, me and Sam wrote this song that almost ended up uh, on the second Bastards record, and it was called Terry Funk versus cactus jack and it was about the, the death match the king of the death match and we wrote we, we we had a chorus it was really good i never saw the light of day i'm not too sure why it was supposed to be, be for the second bastards record but it's i might have gotten lost or something but we had a riff we had a whole thing um because i was you know at that point in time you know there was a lot of like you know i mean the death match stuff uh was still pretty underground. Like it was like, if you wanted to see that kind of a match, you had to, you know, tape trade and, and stuff. I mean, by then though, maybe those FMW uh, DVDs were coming out, but I mean, so there was a song out there called Terry Funk versus Cactus Jack, King of the death match. Down to down to down, you know? So it was like, it was like, it was, it was a cool song. I, I don't know what happened, why it, it, it stopped, but that was also 2003, 2004 when we wrote it. So, can, can we not find it? Is this like findable or is this like hidden in? Well, like, I mean, your... we just wrote it. We wrote it on the bus at like three in the morning, you know, and, and I believe it was on the way 
here's why I remember it because we were due to play uh, the House of Blues in Las Vegas, and I had gotten a hold of some organic salsa that I got food poisoning from. And the reason why I was up was that because it was it might have been about 2000, 2003. So yeah, it was around 2003. So I got food poisoning from this and uh, I was up because I couldn't sleep because my stomach was sick and you can't, you know, do your business on the bus. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I remember that's when we sort of sat down and, 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 and because I remember I put on, I we used to take uh, VHS tapes with me on the road. I would have a suitcase of like wrestling VH VHS tapes and we'd watch wrestling on the bus or I'd show the guys, you know, different matches or whatever, it, you know. And uh, I had shown him that Cactus Jack, Terry Funk, King of the Death match, uh, uh, match and, and they were blown away. No one ever seen anything like that, you know? So um, at least American wrestling, I mean, well, maybe, maybe not, maybe that's an overstatement, but those guys, anyways. So that's why I think it, it, it came up. Well, listen, guys, make sure you get your emails, wrestlingperspective at gmail.com, emails anytime. If you're watching this on Fightful, go follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Yes. Pretty soon, we're going to be making our debut on SiriusXM. I mean, as as we're getting closer and closer, um, it's getting closer and closer to the to that moment. And we'll obviously let you very uh, let, let everybody know. But before we go and get into Swerve, I want just want to uh, give a big shout out to my boy, Dave LaGreca for making it all happen. So thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. And don't forget, you can catch Lars, Lars underscore Fredrickson on Whatnot app. Uh, it depends on day and time. You can go subscribe and you pop up. He sells records and shirts, uh, tons of his memorabilia that he's collected throughout the years. Different shows are different things. You put things together, uh, you know, and it's about well, about once a week, once every two weeks you do these shows. It, I go check them out. I love them. And listen, the best thing about him is when you win, you win the auction right there. You he pulls it and says, you want me to autograph it? What do you want me to say? You type it in the chat and he autographs it right there on camera in front of you. Where else do you fucking get that? Nowhere. Nowhere. Otherwise, you can follow me at Lars Fredrickson on Instagram. I got a blue check. So, you know, it's me or at Laz's Lacus. And that's my my little store. Or you can follow me on uh, Twitter, which is at Roots Radical Zero One. Facebook, eh, I'm not really on there too much, but I do have a page Personal on that page. So, well, I got it. There's there's a page there, you know. But I, I literally I will not check the mail. I will not. It's just, you know, Facebook is too a little too uh, toxic. So uh, if you're watching on Fightful, make sure you go follow us on our private, uh, not private, but our, our our stuff and catch our past interviews, you know, uh, iTunes, Spotify, any place you get your podcast, we're there. We have our own YouTube channel. Just go over and give us a like. Even if you watch yeah. the stuff here, just give us some love there. Yeah. And, you know, do if you go into the like the podcast, you know, review our podcast, give us a five star, leave us a comment. You know, I mean, let's 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 make this thing happen. And thanks to all the, the fine, beautiful folks over at Fightful for giving us a place to come and do this, too. All right. Uh, in like eight seconds, it's Swerve Strickland. So uh, hang on. We'll be right back. Lars, as the 1900s and 90 philosopher and royale. Sir mix -a -Lot once said, mm. Larry is a white guy. People think he's funny. Real estate investor, investor makes a lot of money. And with that, I want to say you and I are trying to move into our guests, posse, Swerve Strickland. Swerve, uh, first and foremost, I am giddy as a little schoolgirl. Lars is excited to have you on. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with us tonight. Absolutely, man. Appreciate you guys for having me. And by the way, no props for breaking out a little Sir Mix a lot, guys. Uh, you know, I was gonna give you props, but then you like tripped over your words. I did. Rookie no, com no competent uh, recording artist would do that. Uh, this, I am, this recording I'm, isn't not as easy as it looks, right? This recording artist stuff. Not I'm as blinded easy as it looks. by the greatness. What is Swerve Strickland? I'm gonna be honest with you guys. 
Oh, well, <laughs> appreciate you. <laughs> so, uh, Swerve, first and foremost, like I said, thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to open up the questionings with a little Parker Boudreau questioning. And For sure. uh, I was a big fan of his coming into AEW. And from recording artists to athletes to wrestlers, when you get uh, hit with the moniker, the next blank, the next Brock Lesnar, the next Michael, right. Jordan, the next this and that, uh, I don't know if it ever works out well. So you get him coming in and you get to work with him with the affiliates. And I, I got to ask, when when you get a talent like his, who I, I enjoy watching, especially this new incarnation with all the tattoos, do you feel – a little bit as the guy who's kind of uh, the senior in the group to take him under your ring and maybe help him wash off that next moniker? Um, oh, yeah. There's a lot of pressure on me as far as that. But I put that pressure upon myself. And, like, there's a lot of uh, people in the fan base that's kind of, like, doubting that because we. I feel like the conditioning is to doubt what's, like, new what's new, what they're uncomfortable with, what they're not used to, they doubt it right away. And um, I'm, that's the adversity that we go to. And, and that's like, honestly, that's the, that's the weight that we bear as entertainers, as artists, performers. You want to give fans something like that hasn't necessarily been done or it's, or they're not, it's just so against the fan base. Like they wanted, like I kept listen, like listening and seeing in social media that, like, oh, we wanted you to have two other like high flyer wrestlers. We wanted you to like have a trios to go against like Kenny Omega and the Bucks and the trios guys. You know, like the like top flight. We wanted that. I'm like, oh, that's what you wanted. Well, I'm not going to give you that then. I'm going to take these guys and make something that you didn't know it's what you wanted, and that's going to take time to do. And having Parker, like kind of like slowly wipe that comparisons away. I don't want him to be compared to anybody. I don't want my other man to be compared to anybody either, especially since he's so new. Like you, the best thing about him, you can't compare him, his look to any other wrestler. And I think that's the beauty of that. And for me, you can't really compare me to any other wrestlers out there either. And that's the beauty of that. And Parker, we're going to mold him into something where he's just not, trying to put on this persona that he's like oh i have to be this like no just be because you're such a cool laid-back dude with like um being in the hip-hop circle and the culture so involved in the culture and stuff like that with us like we got to start showing people that we got to start making people feel like oh okay yeah i see where he's at now now i'm feeling him and that's how you wipe away the whole other brock lesnar comparisons well, you know, one of the things, Swerve, and I always noticed about you, and it's something I want to compliment you on, is you've always had a confidence, which I believe is definitely a big part of your charisma, of who you are, of your talented in the ring, you know, and you seem like a guy who really values that creative freedom. And I know throughout your career, like you pretty much had have had this creative freedom, even in NXT. Um, when you got to the to the big show over there. And did you feel like it was stifled in any way? Um, no, it, um, they still allowed a lot of creative freedom because nobody could talk like us. Nobody could really write our material. So they kind of gave us like guidelines. And when we would just like kind of put our own little spin on it and within however the time would fit it, like even doing like just a little small short promos with the New Day, we just came up with that right then and there or doing something with Sami Zayn and those uh, segments. We just came up with it with those guys there. You know, and we had, like I said, like, that's um, what I really figured out was just trying to create something that nobody else can really tell you how to do it because it's yours. And that's where, and if I, and if you're confident with it, then people believe in it. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of my confidence came from. Just like, I know, I know this will work. I believe in it because I'm the one that can pull this off. I'm the only one that knows and sees three steps ahead, how this can like form and flow into what the culmination is going to be. So you can't take this and put it with them. You can't take this and put it with her. And I have to do it. And I'm confident. I know I can do it. And um, being able to like, like um, 
like stand up to Triple H and say, I know I can do this. I need you to believe in me. That's mm-hmm. where like you can't help but be confident in yourself. And I thought he and I knew he felt that. And therefore he put it out there for me. He just is like, all right, go. Cause you believe in it, I believe in it. And now Tony Khan was the same way with like like the whole of all of 2022, like even me like taking pliers to Billy Gunn's hands, you know, it was like, I believe in this. And then he believed in me and he believed how this would work. Even like bring Kevin Gates and Rick Ross, all these things, they knew it would work because I believed in it and I have to be confident with it. Uh, sticking on that kind of questioning, I've listened to many of your interviews and I was a huge Kill Shop fan. I loved Lucha Underground and it, Listen, it took me a long time to realize you were him. So when I figured it out, I was excited. But along that way of thinking, the Swerve Strickland character doesn't quite have the same mythos as the kill shot. Do you kind of miss being able to have that? Not so much the creative input that you have as a as Shane Strickland, but like kill shot. You you created characters, you created backstories, you created lives and and that's what I love most about it. And I'd love to see, and I wouldn't even know how a, a Swerve Strickland could create a mythos around him, but have do you kind of miss that? Um, no, because it's like evolution. Mm. Uh, I, I'm happy that it happened. I was happy I was able to make it work, make and like do something with that. Like literally season one kept coming in to just being like, hey, we need a new luchador character. What do you got? And I was like, oh, okay. I came up with this name. All right, cool. And then having the break from one to season one to season two being like, I wrote this whole thing out and there's a bunch of different ways we can go. What do you believe? And then they just compiled all that and put it together. That was cool for what that needed to be because once again, it was so against the grain with what was, else was on the show. Like there was Mayan Aztecian warriors with like Lucha heritage with a lot of these characters. There was movie stars, there was killers, there was like, uh, there was dragons. There was all there's guys that rose from the dead, you know. There was all these like like historic type of like um like magic. I was like, mm, this will stand out because I'm going. This will stand out because I'm going this way with it. So being able to do that with the kill shot character in Lucha and create a lore around it, it it hit because it what was missing. And the, like and that's one thing you, I got to be. I'm I'm very self conscious about surveying the landscape of things. What's going on? What this people? What are these people doing? What type of themes are going on on this channel? What is hot right now in box office? What's the number one selling? What's the number one stream show? What's going on? What's uh comics are popping right now? Number one artists? What's the themes of these things? And follow where the wave is taking entertainment in general. You know, and then that I kind of flow with that. And that's where this Swerve Strickland that you're seeing now with mobile affiliates is kind of flowing with the wave of entertainment all around rather than just like picking a gimmick that's nobody else is doing. Well, do you feel like now where you're at with your career, like what's I mean, where do you find the involvement from? Because you were talking about how you evolved the character and, uh, you know, to Swerve. And yeah. from kill shot and these things, like, are you constantly always thinking about where am I going to take this next, or are you kind of like, oh, I'm just going to be here for a minute, and maybe I'm just going to get deeper here, or you yeah. know, with, with this, and then uh, then my next move is this, and I'll know when the time is right. That that's it's more so that the the latter of what you were talking about. I got to feel where I'm at, where I'm at right now, and I got to invest in it. I got to plant my plant my feet, plant my roots into it really get into the groove and when i'm feeling that the people in the audience are feeling that and the locker room is feeling it too so that's where i I gotta plant my feet and then after a while i feel when tides need to turn and it's time to shift to the next gear maybe pull back a gear or okay while i'm in that i'm setting up things because of what i'm taking what i'm being given so i'm taking those things and like okay this is a tool how do I take that tool and make, you know, and, and like create a whole nother manufactured operating utility vehicle as I'm transitioning to the next thing? You know, I mean, it's it's kind of like um, 
like as you're creating a garden, you don't stop um, everything you're doing when you you near uh, planting and seeding those tomatoes. You and move on to the cabbage and the corn. You don't stop it completely. You kind of keep you keep going with it because you want to naturally grow it. And while that's happening, you go to the corn, but you always step back to check on everything else, like the tomatoes and everything else. You always come back to it, but you don't stop yeah. it completely. And that's how I feel with what I do. I'm definitely going to be hungrier after this. Yeah. Episode. Yes. <laughs> v- vegan meals. <laughs> do you, there are very few guys in the wrestling industry that, you know, I'm sure Lars feels the same way that you can look at and go, that guy's going to be bigger than just wrestling. You, you, to me, you are one of those guys, you know, with the rock stone cold with his podcast, the Miz. How is right? Wait, who? The Miz. Oh, stop. That's right. You don't like the Miz. I'm well, sorry. He's the Miz. Hater. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, hey, say what you want. You got to respect the Miz's hustle, man. He, ha- no, no. he is a hustle. He is uh, a hustle. It's a character I play on this podcast. That's all. I love it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, w- I was evolving the character to like to dislike him that much more. There we sorry, go. Sorry, Wait, you want to see more? And John Cena. <laughs> God, um, I'll give John Cena. Yo, I mean, you know, yo, shout, yo, shout out Batista, man. Batista's been killing it too. Glass Onion was amazing, dude. I mean, that's. I mean, let's just talk. You know, right there, Batista. Go ahead, Dennis. I'm sorry. But you're hey. kind of one of those guys with your fingers in so many different pies. How much longer do you plan on wrestling before maybe you evolve out of wrestling and into maybe something else? Um, this one thing I do want fans to cherish the time that they have with certain performers. I want fans to cherish the time they have with me rather than like shitting on what I'm doing <laughs> on a weekly basis or like talking about he fell off or this. I'm like, no, time, timing, and con- being moving. Pro- one one thing Rick Ross says, I don't want to just move. I want to move. Uh, I want to I want to move correctly. Mm. Instead, of just moving in directions and being here, being there. Like, yeah, you're moving, but are you are you progressing as you're moving, or are you just doing movement? No, I want to move correctly and progressively. Every move I make should push something forward. Push my guys forward. Push my product forward. Push the podcast. Push the music. Push the persona forward or push the product forward something has to go forward with anything that i do and i have to as a character as a what i portray on screen i have to take that with me to the next thing and that's something i learned with um honestly struggling to get over like earning that um with that being said like transitioning to other things um when the time is right i feel it i'll know um because the the main issue you see with like a John Cena, Dwayne, Batista, guys like that is their the other projects that they put their hands in has just consumed so much of like their time so that they have to dedicate so much time and energy and money and production to those things. And right now I haven't gotten to that point yet where music or like whatever thing like the podcast is like on a pat mcafee level it's not like at the joe rogan level so i still have a lot of time i can could still work on this and like i'm not getting tour dates on albums yet to like sell out arena so i still have a lot of time i can dedicate to what my primary passion and dream and and job was is is wrestling you know so um but those passions are already there definitely music is moving up closer and closer to one of my top passions probably like just before pro wrestling because pro wrestling is like truly what got me up out of my mom's house and couch mm-hmm. to go chase a dream and some of that once again i believed in uh, music is right there with that because it's like something that people doubted at first and they didn't really see the vision but i was like you know what? i think i have a chance with this and i'm meeting the right people at the right time especially with AEW and the momentum with like being on live television every week there's a lot of equity in that to be able to push things and like maneuver and meet, make connections and network Lars. And I'm, I'm sure you know all about that. Well, you know, one of the things I will say is that you, you, you strike me and this is just a, probably another compliment. You're just a master manifester. I can see the, how tuned in you are, how connected you are. And that happens to great artists And that. And like you were talking about earlier, 
just about people not understanding what you're doing, but you still stay the course. And at yeah. some point they're going to figure it out. It's going to switch. You know, it's like, that's fucking punk rock. Right. So yeah, I get yeah, that oh, yeah. to the soul, to the soul. One of the things I want to say though, that where I feel like you really have pushed the envelope was when it, with this, this interview that I've seen with you and Dustin Ro Rhodes. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This was something, I mean, you just went in there, no holds barred. And it's, it's like, it's a beautiful story and already happened just with that interaction between the two of you and the way that you came in, the way he responded was shades of the wrestling that I fell, no, was the wrestling that I fell in love with as a kid. It was like honest to goodness foundation for great fucking storytelling. So how much of this because I've obviously been around professional wrestlers for a very long time. I know what it takes for you guys yeah. to kind of, to get to your place. How yeah. much of that feeling was legitimate, legitimate. Um, there, there's still a lot. Um, there's so much, there's only so much of this answer, uh, question I can answer because yes. there's a lot of seeds I do want to plant for the future Understood. with this. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, maneuver correctly here. Yes, sir. Um, yes, sir. Honestly, I, from what I, for me personally, what I like to operate off of is pain mm -hmm. and going by the timing of Dustin, um, with the, with like the, with his family and everything, yeah, yeah. um, there's a lot of pain there. And with that being said, pain can be manipulative mm -hmm. on the outside. You can take that and use it as a weaponized like mm -hmm. just just like love love can be weaponized mm -hmm. and i think like that's what cinema is we weaponize emotion and um especially with um seeing where his brother was about to go over mm -hmm. this past weekend i'm <laughs> like uh that's another emotion we can tap into and seeing as my former partner you know uh there's a connection there as well uh, we can weaponize that too. And it just got to really trickling down to like um, connecting dots and people and targeting pain and weaponizing it and emotion. So it's like, it's, it's, it's like, um, oh man, you see this guy sat on his luck right now. He's not feeling good, but you're in my way. Move. <laughs> you're in my way. And why why you want to talk to him like that? Because I'm sick of I like I don't I don't care. I'm I have the authority now. My ego has the authority now because I have people with me. So it's not like so people kind of understand that situation. Like okay, I gotta like even if I do confront someone like a Dustin who can hold his own with anybody, he still has to second guess and really stop think about the situation he's in because of those guys and those right. those entities around me and that's weaponizing his pain i'm like i want you to i want you to do something because you're feeling that and i can manipulate you and get you a response off of that and that's what i play with because of like I, i'm a big um i'm a big um uh, a movie person so i study like a, a daniel day lewis guys like that i study like a philip seymour hoffman's guys like that these are like top top like cinematic like a uh, movie acting gods to in my mind who are just good at playing off of one emotion and then just tapping that over and over again over and over again and over these next couple weeks i would advise people to really pay attention to how i play with these things i don't have it all figured out yet but that's the beauty of it that's the to me that's the fun of it i'm like i don't want to think about it i want to go off of the feel of it i want to just come to work that day and be like oh i got something and it just popped into my head or like as we're performing it's like oh this is how i'm really going to hit you and that's where the fun and that's where the confidence comes from because now i'm in the feel and i'm in the fun of it so therefore i know it's going to work well, not only that, but you have a great, uh, sorry, Dennis, I, I just, I have a piggyback of that because I know Dustin's is just, Dustin is the, a consummate professional and would be open to something like this. So true, I guess true. my, my, my follow-up question is, 
is that who uh, was was it your idea? If so, how did you bring it to him? Or was it his idea? And if so, how did he bring it to you? Or was it a culmination of the both of you? I brought it to him because um, uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine that's a real big fan. And he just got a, he thought of somebody. He's like, man, like you, you work really well with a lot of the legends. Right. Like me and Billy Gunn worked really well together. Right. You work a lot, you, you know, like I want to see you work with more legends. And I was like, oh, and then we like Dustin came to mind and I was like, Hey Dustin, man, like, I think I, I think I got something. And the promo that night was supposed to be about me, but I was like, no, let's build, let's build my opponent and flip the scenario and put it around him and build his sympathy. And then that's what I'll do. Cause I got to once again, create pain. Mm -hmm. Once I create that pain, now I can target something, you know, and being the egotistical mogul that I am, I want, I want the camera. I want the spotlight. I want more attention on me. Why is this not happening? Why is this not happening? What, what, like, I want that. And not only do I want that, I want to take it from you, you. who's suffering. Fuck yeah. yeah. Fuck <laughs> yeah. With, without giving away too much, when you're done with that promo, do you realize right away what kind of magic you just made? Or do you wait to see the reaction from the fans and go, holy shit, that's money? I, I wait for the reactions for sure. Cause like, I, I, I you don't want to get too overconfident with what you're doing because then it's just like, I know it's good. And then it's like, Oh man, you didn't learn anything from that. Cause you just, you assumed that it was going to be good. You know what I mean? You still got to like, as much as like, I don't want to contradict what I was saying. Cause I'm like, I know this will work, but you also got to be open to be like, yeah, I know it'll work, but man, it wasn't the right time. It wasn't the right opponent. It wasn't the right, uh, city it wasn't the right like uh it wasn't the right uh episode to do it in or the timeline so yeah it could work you're right but the responses wasn't as much as you thought it would be because it didn't hit all it, it wasn't executed properly this one i felt like i know this i know this couldn't work but i still gotta wait and see and get the um get the response and get the people's emotions and then when a lot of people started like really shitting on me calling me like names and stuff on social media i'm like there we go yeah and That's and they lame. hate the and they hate the guys behind me even more they're like get rid of those guys why are they there i'm like <laughs> like uh, i'm like why would i why would i get rid of them because you hate them why now i'm gonna keep them and push them more <laughs> like you know what i mean i don't want people that you like to back me up i want people that you hate you don't want to see because well, at the end of the day you're going to want to see me perform well, but you have to deal with seeing these guys yeah Res <laughs> wrestling psychology 101 you know you fucking hated rick flair but you hated him more because of Tolly blanchard arn and Ole. exactly yeah exactly and, and you know it's it's almost i feel like it is and I, and I hope i'm not jinxing it but it's almost set up for su success because we heard the big announcement from dustin this is going to be his last year we're talking mm -hmm. about a guy who can wrestle a fucking wet paper bag, as can yeah. you. Your two styles, you know, he said it was going to be his last year here. You're the young buck. I mean, this makes perfect sense. I just promise me it's not going to be over in a fucking month because that's when I'll shoot my face off because it's like that good. Like that's that's good story storytelling, you know, and um, do you feel like that is an, a, a, an art these days because you have the independent scene because you have crash course tv you have to grab someone's attention you know do you feel like that's so, somewhat of a lost start at times it it, it really is it really is <laughs> um and um i that, that's something that i i've never been a, a fan of just like give it give you everything in a couple weeks and a couple months and stuff um when we had paul hauser come in um with the golden globe he complimented m myself and the keith lee so much about how drawn out and how many intricacies with our story as being partners and like the ins and outs of like am i going to turn and all this other stuff he loved it so much because so it, it felt like it took its time and uh, i feel like we have one of the best storylines that are like not being talked about talked about as much like as far as like the mainstream media or you know but i'm i'm okay with that because that these storylines are building us the people the, the performers the characters you know so i i love that about it you know um so we have the same thing to do the same we have a chance to do the same thing here with dustin 
you know, um, and especially it possibly being his last year. I'm not sure if it might be 100% his last year. It's wrestling. Well, it, is, want... it is wrestling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's like 100%. Like, I mean, I'm, what are we talking, 365? Are we talking like, you know, leap years? Are we talking fiscal? <laughs> you know, are we talking um, pay per view years? You know, so there's a bunch of ways that can go in the, in the industry. But for me, I'm just like, I've got to. I got to get in there at some point because I know, I know there's so much we can create. And like, of course, like the in-ring athleticism and the physicality is there, but like how, how much more would that be if like people really wanted to see me get hurt from him or people really were concerned about him possibly getting hurt. And maybe, maybe I'm the one, he doesn't make it to the full year. Maybe I cut it off right then and there, you know, who knows, but there's something, but that adding that mystique to it, it puts people a little bit closer to the edge of the seat to watch like and pay attention to a lot of the smaller things now rather than just, just seeing a really good match happening like they're watching to see like dustin anticipate things or watching those the facials the muscles they're paying attention more to the outside because you know those guys are out there you know like all right what's he hold what's he holding in his hand why is he taking so long in these corners like what's going on so oh, like there's now we have that uh, and those suspenseful moments that are just naturally there. This is this, this naturally happening. And we didn't, and, but we put that together because we put like tension into the air. You're one of these guys that you've held. It feels like about an even amount of tag team championships and singles championships throughout the companies you've, you've been in and you, you've, I, I want to say somehow maneuvered around that moniker of he's a tag team wrestler guy, but you get gold at NXT, Evolve, MLW, you come to the AEW tag team champ. What do you think in your mind you need to do to make that next step to AEW world champion? Or do you think you're already there? You're just waiting on the knock on the door to carry the strap on your shoulder. Um, I'm always prepping and try to get more. Um, if it's if this isn't enough, then I I do I do need to do more, like whatever it's going to take. Um, uh, then I I I got, and that's also like that's not something that people tell you, like oh man we 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 put you up there as the, like one of the world champion guys like contending for the world title if you did this. It's it's never that simple. It's just something magic. Something magic has you got to got catch you got to catch lightning in a bottle at the right time for you like and then it's there you know what i mean so what i i i'm always going to say I, I i need more i'm always going to go into tony's office and say hey like i appreciate everything that's happening but i'm ready to i'm ready to get heated up again hey i need we need more added to this hey what can we do what can we do to like boost this get me here get the I would I did the same thing with Triple H and Shawn Michaels and it's not an ego thing it's a it's a it's a winning thing I want to win and I want to help this company win and I feel like I truly feel like I'm one of the biggest pieces on the board that can help any product win like Jericho said it with my ratings every time I appear on television I pop a rating because that's how much I want to produce out there to win it's like I'm like I'm 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 honored and proud of that but i'm more proud that i can do that for the product and i feel like if you if you, uh, people understand that you are your intention is not just for you but for everything around it and the product and the story the match itself you'll always be in positions to win well i i'm kind of you know Although having the gold and all that stuff is is something that's important, you know, for some wrestlers, I I just don't see you in that. I know that you've had a lot of accomplishments, but you know, I see you as like a like a Roddy Piper. I feel like you bring that kind of thing to wrestling, you know. I, I mean, and that's that's like a you know that's a high compliment, and it's a once in a lifetime thing. And I feel it's because of that creation that you have. Um. Do you think that, uh, you know, 
doing the indies and stuff. Cause the first time I ever saw you perform was at, I can't remember if it was an APW show or if it was a BTW show here. And I live in San Francisco. So, and it was, Oh, oh I, that was, Oh, that was, um, like ACW. King of, yeah. Well, yeah, I think so. Cause it was like a King of the Indies kind of a thing. Yeah. 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 Does that make sense? Well, uh, it was against uh, Jake Atlas, I believe. That's right. It was. Oh, yeah. Jake Atlas. Yes. yes. Yes, it was. That was, uh, that was my one and only ACW show. Yeah. So I was yeah. there. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah. And uh, I just remember seeing you because my buddy Kevin Gill was like, you know, Swerve's coming to town, whatever. So took the kids, whatever. And I knew instantaneously when you came out, the charisma. You saw it. You saw it. So, but do you feel like the the championship that i'm sorry it took me so long to get my question but do you feel like no. championships really define the wrestler or do you feel like the wrestler sort of defines the championship um it can i feel like it can work both ways depending like um i feel like before like for mjf i feel like he was already defined before he even won the world title you know what I mean? I felt like he's already put himself in such a high place on the show and the product for the company that the championship was like it was it was a culmination for it. But I'm like, cool. But like, I still like with or without the championship now. I feel like MJF is still MJF. I don't think he went crazy high or or he dropped or anything. I feel like he's still, you know, where he's at. Um, but. I feel like maybe putting a championship on a Ricky Starks is what puts him over right. that that hill. You know what I mean? So it can work either way. And it, once again, it's all about timing. Timing is the big thing. Um, and the right person and the, and the right opponents, the right, you know, does a championship, like a championship doesn't culminate the end of me and the, um, a Dustin. You know what I mean? It would no. it it, it kind of messes it up, right? You know where you know what I mean. So no. I don't think that's where it's that's needs you know. But like sometimes it's like, um, like right now where a Cody Rose is at, the championship definitely needs to be placed somewhere in this story, right? Right, right. now, it's this is it's the timing and it makes sense, you know. Um, well, it, it so, is the story though. That, that yeah, is the story. yeah. If he does if he doesn't get it now, then they fucking killed him. You know what I'm saying? So it's like. You know, I mean, it almost writes itself, but sorry to interrupt. Yeah, oh, I no, 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 no. The tweet, fuck the roads. I don't know who tweeted it, but someone tweeted something along the line to fuck the road. So I'm just going to quote yeah, that tweet. Yeah, the, the entirely um, legacy, you know, <laughs> like, you know, we'll like once again, continue watching the story as it unfolds. You'll see why I'm so deep into this right. feeling of that, you know, like a leg, I'm like, there's, the legacy of these legends that are continuing to create problems for me, you'll understand. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like uh, for me, the timing of a championship will come when you know it and you'll feel it. And you'll be like, oh, we know where this is going. Oh, this is where the momentum swing is happening. And when, but like right now, I'm, I'm okay with like what I'm doing in building I'm okay with like creating foundations right now because I don't want to just take off without having the like why where who I don't feel yet I got to make you feel first then I can take off I, I do want to talk a little bit about your music and uh, I believe yeah. it was the sessions podcast you were on where you were talking about how you keep your music separate from wrestling do you do yeah. you feel pressure from fans to add that into your music? Because I think wrestling mm. fans are fickle, where they feel like if you're not wrestling one hundred percent of the time, twenty four seven seven days a week, then you're either a poser. Or you don't love the industry. Um, oh, that's what I don't want. Wrestling fans, uh, mm. for my music, that's not what I want. I want music fans for my music. I want wrestling fans wrestling and that's where you kind of avoid those kind of like traps with people of like uh, fans are like oh he's not as dedicated to this or like oh like 
why don't he do a song with this wrestling rapper or this guy this like oh it's not my kind of thing that's not my kind of genre i'm like i'm not making it for you first off i'm making it for me but i'm making it for people that um like um i'm in the industry with and they have an audience and a demographic and a sound that isn't necessarily tapped into wrestling and that's where I'm like, oh man, if I cater my music to like these guys over here and like this demographic, maybe that brings that crossover appeal into wrestling. They were like, yo, okay, this this dude is dope. I like his music. You know, he's a wrestler, right? Wait, what? Oh, snap, where? And then that comes over. Like, so there was, I was at a complex con in LA and like um, I'm getting introduced to a lot of these fashion designers and artists and guys like that. They were like, Yo, man, like this is my guy. Yo, he's he's a wrestler, yada yada yada. And they was like, oh yeah, he just did something with Rick Ross on TV. He's like, oh where? Let me see. And he shows him, and he shows shows the accusations thing. He's like, oh, I seen the accusations thing. I'm like, okay, you seen this, but you knew you weren't watching wrestling when you saw it. So that goes to show me the reach is actually working. Like it's getting to people in these circles at Complex Con and like these mute high level industry people that it's getting to them not through wrestling though but it's getting to them and now with that being said now like i'm in that kind of like i i'm in, I'm in that that um there i'm in their sites now i got well i also do this here's my music this is where i work with this is like i, I mess with so and so and then you go on my social media then you see so and so follows me and is connected with this, and then I'm like, oh, you know him? Yeah, yeah. Oh, like okay. So you were within our family a little bit. Now I'm. This has nothing to do with wrestling. Now I'm in the family of like this producer and this rapper and this camp and this guy. Oh, you're with those guys. Now I mess with you. Now I'm gonna pay attention a little bit more closely. And so I have to keep those separately so I connect the dots outside of wrestling and all these other music genres and people and avenues to bring them to see me in wrestling that's kind of where my rating the rating does come up a little bit more i wouldn't say i'm like i shoot the ratings to the freaking stars or anything but i do get a little bit more notoriety because of those kind of connections okay i got a two-part question first part is this you're one i mean you're a really nice guy you got a great mind and uh, you know you're a, you're a great antagonist so the first part of this question is because you're a great antagonist because you're a heel because you're tweeting out fuck the roads because you're telling this story over here right because you're going to probably have music fans that you know obviously come to you through wrestling or maybe outside but they're seeing you as this antagonist do you ever worry that's that's going to maybe uh you know take away from the message that you're trying to say and how you're expressing yourself lyrically um it, like if my in my music it's kind of like you do get both sides of me there's a dichotomy right. there you do get like because now nobody's 100 percent pure right even some of the nicest people in the world have negative things to say in their music and they have negative messages that's put across and some things that like even people motivational speakers talk about bad shit it's just the way it is balance of good and evil and i feel like i balance even my negative messages with uh a, a, there's a, there's a sense to that there's like oh i actually understand once again pain i understand why he's out lash, lashing out because of this or why he's on this side of things because that's explained in the music and that's what gives people to the reason to listen to the music because it's like, oh man, I see him as this, but I'm getting this, but I get why. I know what he is, but like, yo, okay, there he does have that side to him too. He does have that sound and that like that a bounce to it, but at the same time, the way he's painting the story and painting the picture of things, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm I, I can almost relate to this in in many ways, because like, or there's a lot of times I'm pretty sure you listen to a lot of artists growing up. That's like he's saying something that I wish I could put into words, but he just right. like he just put it out there in such a way I feel this, like I feel it, like I like some people don't know how to express their feelings, or think they're alone in their minds, 
but then they hear a song or listen to an album from one of their favorite artists and they just paint the perfect picture of how you're feeling. And that's the beauty of one wrestling. And that's the beauty of music. You can do the same thing with both. And I don't think people should judge the artist on a personal level for that. Or even in the music side, they, like there's, I don't think there's a mixed message. If anything, on the music side, they like it a lot more because like, oh man, like now I, I, I see the, I see the vision more from the music. There's a visual to the, uh, to the sound now. Well, I guess the reason why I asked that question, and I'll get to yeah. the second part of my question, is because obviously when we were making records, and I mean we're still making records, but yeah. when we started making records, it was before the internet. It was before really a lot of like recorded sort of interactions or whatever. And the one thing I'd always get was like, you're actually a nice person. It's like, well, what do you fucking want me to do? Come like fucking kill your right. cat and like, you, right. know, you know, fucking feed your mom shit or something. I don't know. But like, right. <laughs> so the second part of my question is, is that, okay, I got offered to be a general manager at a wrestling promotion. Okay. And this is okay. legit. This is legit. And the guy says to me, I don't even know what to pay you. Swerve Strickland, I'm part of the posse now. What's my payday look like? Man, I I, I would say it's pretty it's pretty up there. I would say it's pretty up there. Like give me, me personally. Give me, a, give me a dollar amount. Man. Wait, well, uh, well, you're under contract with this podcast for at least three more years. Excuse me, but my managers and I are having a talk. Yeah. Man. On the see, see, on the music side of me, I'd I'd throw the I'd throw the whole like checkbook at you. Wrestling side, man, I don't think you can get about a good like but wrestling's also like a little a little cheap sometimes. Wrestling I mean, can be a little cheap. It is an indie too. It is an it indie. is, yeah. So we gotta be generous at the same time. Exactly. Cause we want yeah. I wanna I, w- I would like to come back. I wouldn't want to break the bank you know right right so it's like oh you might see them next year this next appearance uh can i ask a uh, question do, do yeah. you have to travel to this promotion or they find yeah, you i'm like driving i do i would have to travel and use my passport okay oh okay mm. i'd say about a good five 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 k maybe okay all right for that for that for that okay yeah. all right i like you I yeah, like it's not a bank breaker. Yeah, <laughs> it's not, uh, it's like not it. a bank. It's not a bank breaker, but it's also in this like it's a it's a a good investment and a token of appreciation type. Thank you. It's like a good middle ground. I like it. Okay. Well, well listen, yeah. I I know we're wrapping up this podcast, and I definitely have one last question. Not so much along the same lines as Lars, but what do I have to do to be part of your posse? Uh, you are my current favorite wrestler and, and personality. Appreciate I've, uh, it. I've made that quite clear. I've texted you 900 times, uh, letting you know that, asking what's up. Can we hang yeah. out? We're going to get tonight, <laughs> as all the kids would say. But what do right. I have to do to be part of your posse now? Because let's be honest, you've got three badass, but every posse needs a nerdy white guy that can make people laugh. <laughs> Man. Every posse does. Keep that in mind now. I'll tell you right now, they're already upset with the white guys I have. <laughs> the fan base is right there. <laughs> they're, you they're pretty, me. They're pretty, so adding a nerdy one in there, they're really just going to go off on me every mm. week. Uh, but oh, you can make shit. them laugh. But if you can make them laugh. Oh. But you also have the music connections in there as well. Just one connection. I don't know just if that one, counts much. Just, just one. one connection. Just Lars. That's my only connection. <laughs> and that, uh, you know. I mean, Lars has a better chance of getting in than I do, and I'm pretty sure all he has to do is be like, "Swerve, we're in," right? And then everybody's like, "Dennis, in there." But I, that, can, I, like, I think, that, I think that, I think that's it. I think we need somebody to talk to authority figures. We need somebody to talk to security. We need somebody to talk to the cops. We need somebody to, hey, get your hands off our guy. Let him in. Hey, I know, I know somebody that can get some things for us to, you know, get get the job done. Hey, hide this. We don't need this confiscated. I think you could be that guy. Yes. I'm I'm like that guy when you guys go into a club and they'll be like, Swerve, you're in, you're in, Parker, you're in, you're in. And then they put those, you know, leather, th- no leather, but the velvet rope down right before. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Sorry, man, we're at capacity. I'll be like, Swerve, Swerve. And you'll just keep walking and then you'll catch me on the way out. Oh, 
not unless you providing, you know, bringing the girls over or something like that. If you bring, but the, then the, again, you know, if he, he, uh, it, br- uh, the nerdy white guy bringing the girls, I don't know, Swerve. I don't know. Did, or is he I can't say no girls bring him for me? I mean, I'll tell you or, what. Or is he paying the girls to come over? There's a there. Hey, there's yeah, there's, there's that there's too. I, I'm pretty sure with that face, he'd be good with the cops, though. <laughs> oh, oh, for sure, for sure, absolutely. I'm like, hey, like, why are you why are you holding this guy captive? <laughs> like, no, he's with us. I promise. Excuse me, sir. Uh, I'm here to clear up some misconceptions we might have about this situation. That thing- like, I like it. Yeah, I like. Yeah, that's a good face. That's a good. That's a good. That's, I, just the voice alone yes. gets you, gets you a warning. I mean, <laughs> I'll take whatever I can get at this point, Swerve, to get into your posse. But Lars, why don't you wrap this thing up? All right. Well, last last yeah. question, but before we go, Swerve, let everybody know out there where they can find you. Like what? Man, what social media, Swerve Competent on both platforms, IG and Twitter. The Swerve City Podcast right here. We just filmed the episode with the JAS Daddy Magic. And nice. man, uh, and, and Angelo Parker. It was funny. It's inspirational. It'll motivate you. It taps all the emotions, and it's really good. It's coming out on YouTube.com backslash Swerve City Podcast. There's also a bunch of other crazy episodes that we have filmed. I'll show you, like, our wall of fame over here of podcast episodes. We got Eddie Kingston over here, Pat McAfee, Drew McIntyre, Lisa Ann, Music Soul Child. We got Bailey over there, Tony Khan. You know himself we've we've done a lot of crazy great things and we didn't think we'd make it that far but here we are we're doing it we're about to be on the jericho cruise actually filming nice. an episode of the swerve city podcast coming up next week so that's gonna be awesome so check it out youtube.com backslash swerve city podcast and check out my music my first single debut album is coming out this spring you couldn't be me i could have been you it's going to be dope it's awesome i got benny the butcher from Griselda featured on there. I got a lot of good guests coming in on that album. Production-wise, from Prophet the Producer, who won two Grammys working with Kanye on Donda album. Uh, Rich Lotta, uh, DJ Flip out there in LA. Spiff, um, who works with Rick Ross. I got a lot of assistance on this album. Juice from Flatbush Zombies is on there, too, waiting for his verse to get back to me. He got some time, but don't take too long. So, Download my music, Swerve the Realist, on social media, and Swerve City on the social and on all streaming platforms. Swerve, I hate it when people send me a text or an email going, "You know who you should have on your podcast?" Of this guy, like, "Hey, asshole, I would have him on if he would return my emails." But do you know who <laughs> you should have on your podcast, Lars? Who's that? Oh. Uh, yeah. My I'm thing down. is, my thing is, what we do, we like to have you here. We like well, to have you here in the spot to be i live in orlando florida because we have the couch now it's a comfortable situation we moved away from like you know the two two um folding chairs with the monitor now we just like the comfort of like literally guys hanging out in the man cave type feel now i just i just figured it all out we take that five grand you got them from that wrestling promotion <laughs> turn it into so our airplane we flip kit. it <laughs> yes i am out to the podcast everybody wins look at well, me if, See, oh, that's why you keep me around well next time i'm i'm in orlando i'm stopping by that's for sure of I'd course love to do that. but absolutely you know, um i got one last question it's actually a fan question um but, but and it's really easy to answer and i think you're going to know the answer to of it but i just want to say that watching you over the years and watching you develop has been an absolute pleasure i think you're a fucking immaculate talent I hope they don't sleep on your ass because you're something to behold. I think you're more than just a diamond in a rough. I got, I, I've got more nice things to say, but the last question is from a fan, whose house is this? Man, you know what Swerve's house, baby. Mogul affiliates in the building as well, bro. Let's get right it. Right on. Right on. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening to the Wrestling per- Perspective. I'm all tongue-tied because I'm all still giddy like a girl during this whole podcast. But listen, we'll say our goodbyes off the air. The end of the podcast is now. Go home. We'll see you later. Swerve Strickland. Thank you, buddy.